This hour, the podcast is exclusively sponsored by my good friends at Advantage Gold. Advantage Gold is a five-star rated gold company with one-of-a-kind customer service. And when it comes to gold and precious metals, Advantage Gold is the only company I'll work with. Call Advantage Gold today and make sure you let them know that Mark Levin sent you. And now, let's begin. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting them from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. I hope you're well. A couple hours ago, there was headline news, Mr. Producer. I believe it's the last day of Ramadan, Eid, I think it's called. And um, it's Islam's holy month of fasting. And there was a shooting that occurred in Philadelphia in the Parkside neighborhood. An Eid event. Almost a thousand people were there. It's a lot of people. And um, there were gunfire. People got hit. It was a terrible scene, as a matter of fact, in a park. And the media were all geared up. They brought on F- ex-FBI agents, ex-police, and others that were, if not suggesting, certainly implying that this was a shooting because it was Ramadan, the last day of Ramadan, and a thousand Muslims were gathered in this one place. Now, let me make something abundantly clear. I have nothing for contempt for anybody who kills anybody. Innocence, period. I have no problem whatsoever with people who practice their faith peacefully. Period. Period. And the funny thing is, people talk to me. The person I work with at my bank is a Pakistani Muslim. Person, people that I know quite well, quite closely, and all courts, sorts of things that we do around this house and we do around our studio, Muslims. And they are disgusted, many of them, with the Islamists, because they threaten them too. But stereotypes are created by the media. So when you criticize Islamists, notice I didn't say Muslims. When you criticize Islamists, terrorists who push terrorist ideology, the media want you to say Muslim. Now, the media were all geared up to hit this morning, noon, and night. It's disappeared totally from the headlines now. Why? 
Well, now we know more facts. Two factions, reports ABC News, pulled out guns and started shooting at each other at the outdoor gathering, according to Philadelphia Police Commissioner Kevin Bethel. 30 shots were fired. A 22-year-old was shot in the stomach during the gunfire. Juvenile self-transported to a hospital with a gunshot wound to the hand. Both were in stable condition. An officer at the event shot a 15-year-old boy who was allegedly armed with a gun. According to Bethel, the teen was shot in the shoulder and leg. The officer recovered the firearm and transported the teen to a hospital. A child also fractured their leg. And they were hit by a responding officer's car. Five people have been arrested in connection with the shooting. They include the 15-year-old who was shot by the officer, as well as four suspects, three juveniles and an adult, who fled the scene with guns, multiple guns, according to Bethel. Five weapons were recovered. A motive remains unknown. But they said two factions pulled out guns and started shooting at each other. So the headlines disappear. Because the media wanted it to be something else. They certainly thought it would be something else. That's not to say that can't happen. There's a lot of very evil people. A lot of very evil people. It's not to say it can't happen, but it didn't. The media, the American media, there's a lot being said today about a gentleman named Yuri Berliner. He's a very courageous man. He's a veteran reporter, employee of PBS, uh, of NPR rather, and uh, an editor. And he's worked very closely with people who work there for a long time. And apparently he wrote a piece in the free press which I want to get to momentarily. But here's what amazes me. He doesn't tell us anything we didn't know. The fact is that he's very brave in coming out and telling us, reinforcing what we already know. So I would tell my colleagues in TV and radio, it wouldn't hurt you. It wouldn't hurt you if you would actually educate and inform yourselves more. Over half a million of you read a book called Unfreedom of the Press. You know what's going on in the press instinctively. It's common sense. And you also know the history of it and the extent of it because you read. They don't. Unfreedom of the Press is about how those entrusted with news reporting the modern media are destroying freedom of the press from within. Not government oppression or suppression, not President Donald Trump's finger pointing, this was written several years back, but present day newsrooms and journalists, indeed social activism, progressive groupthink, Democrat Party part- partisanship, opinion and propaganda passed off as news, the staging of pseudo events, self censorship, bias by omission, and outright falsehoods are too often substituting for old fashioned objective fact gathering and news reporting. A self-perpetuating and reinforcing mindset has replaced independent and impartial thinking. And the American people know it. Thus, the credibility of the mass media has never been lower. This book could easily have been ten times in its current length, but that would make it unreadable for most. Nonetheless, I mean, even its current length, it's unreadable for some, apparently. Much ground is covered and research undertaken, and many authors and scholars consulted as the history of the American press and the evidence of its decades-long demise are carefully examined. The purpose of Unfreedom of the Press is to jumpstart a long, overdue, and hopefully productive dialogue among the American citizenry on how best to deal with the complicated and complex issue of the media's collapsing role as a bulwark of liberty, the civil society, and republicanism, ranging from the early newspapers and pamphlets, promoting the principles set forth in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, to the subsequent party press and transparent allegiance to one party or the other, to the progressive approach of so-called professional reporting, and now the ideologically driven advocacy press of today. So for those of you who read this book, this is not new. What's new is the gentleman had the courage to come forward for which he should be thanked. Unlike the early Patriot Press, today's newsrooms and journalists are mostly hostile to America's founding principles, traditions, and institutions. They do not promote free speech and press freedom, despite their self-serving and self-righteous claims. Indeed, 
They serve as societal filters attempting to enforce uniformity of thought and social and political activism centered on the progressive, a.k.a. American Marxist ideology and agenda. Issues, events, groups, and individuals that do not fit the narrative are dismissed or diminished. Those that do fit the narrative are elevated and celebrated. Of course, this paradigm greatly influences the culture, the government, and the national psyche. It defines a media-created reality, whether or not it has a basis in true reality, around which individuals organize their thoughts, beliefs, and in some cases, their lives. Yet there is mystery and opacity that surround all of it. And if one dares to question or criticize the motives and work product of this enterprise or aspects of it, that is, the reporting by one or more newsrooms, the response is often knee-jerk and emotionally charged, with the inquirer or critic portrayed as hostile to press freedom and the collective media circling the wagons around themselves. Bears remembering that the purpose of a free press, like the purpose of free speech, is to nurture the mind, communicate ideas, challenge ideologies, share notions, inspire creativity, and advocate and reinforce America's founding principles. That is, to contribute to a vigorous, productive, healthy, and happy individual and to a well-functioning civil society and republic. And the media are to expose official actions aimed at squelching speech and communication. But when the media function as a propaganda tool for a single political party and ideology, they not only destroy their own purpose, but threaten the existence of a free republic. It is surely not for the government to control the press, and yet the press seems incapable of policing itself. We must remember, we are not merely observers. We are the citizenry. We, the people, for whom this nation was established and for whom it exists, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and I quote, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and serve the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Hence, we must demand a media worthy of our great republic. And we begin the process by informing ourselves about those institutions and individuals and their practices and standards who, by their own anointment, proclaim the high-minded obligation of informing us. That's the three-page introduction on freedom of the press. It only gets better after that. So it is somewhat curious that this book that was number one on the New York Times bestseller list, list for a month or two, maybe three, but sold over half a million copies, received virtually no notice on any conservative newsroom uh, other than on the Internet. Why would that be? I'm not saying opinions, opinion makers, I'm talking about newsrooms. Now it comes forward, Yuri Berliner a veteran of the public radio institution. And he says the network lost its way when it started telling listeners how to think. And you already know this. What's unique here is that somebody's come forward, still works at NPR, so he comes forward at personal, potential personal uh, attack against him, and that's what they've started to do. And he says in the free press... And I will note that the New York Times uh, opinion page or book review section never reviews my books. Not when Barry Weiss was there and not since. And that's okay. They would just trash him anyway. He said, you know, the stereotype of the NPR listener, an EV driving, worldly playing, tote bag carrying coastal elite. It doesn't precisely describe me, but it's not far off. I'm Sarah Lawrence, educated, was raised by a lesbian peace activist mother. I drive a Subaru, and Spotify says my listening habits are most similar to people in Berkeley. I fit the NPR mold. I cop to that. So when I got a job here 25 years ago, I never looked back. As a senior editor on the business desk, where news is always breaking, we've covered up evils in the workplace, supermarket prices, social media, and AI. It's true NPR NPR has always had a liberal bent, but during most of my tenure here, an open-minded, curious culture prevailed. We were nerdy, but not knee-jerk activists or scolding. 
In recent years, however, that has changed. Today, those who listen to NPR or read its coverage online find something different, the distilled worldview of a very small segment of the U.S. population. If you're conservative, you will read this and say, duh, it's always been this way, but it hasn't. Actually, it has. Maybe not in NPR, but certainly in the last multiple decades. For decades, since its founding in 1970, a wide swath of America turned, tuned into NPR for reliable journalism and gorgeous audio pieces with birds singing in the Amazon. Millions came to us for conversations that exposed us to voices around the country and the world, r- radically different from our own, engaging precisely because they were unguarded and unpredictable. No image generated more pride within NPR than the farmer listening to Morning Edition from his or her tractor at sunrise. Back in 2011, although NPR's audience tilted a bit to the left, it still bore a resemblance to America at large. 26% of listeners described themselves as conservative, 23% middle of the road, 37% as liberal. By 2023, the picture was completely different. Only 11% described themselves as very or somewhat conservative, 21% middle of the road, 67% were very or somewhat liberal. We weren't just losing conservatives, we were also losing moderates and traditional liberals. An open-minded spirit no longer existed within NPR. Now, predictably, we don't have an audience that reflects America. That wouldn't be a problem for an openly polemical news outlet serving a niche audience, but for NPR, which purports to consider all things, it's devastating, both for its journalism and its business model. There's a few more paragraphs I want to continue when we return because it's reflective of the entire media, quite frankly. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Are once mighty dollars under siege from runaway inflation? For those still working, your paychecks buy less while costs for gas, food, cars, utilities skyrocket thanks to inflation. That's why I'm urging all my listeners to register for the upcoming Gold and Silver Summit hosted by our friends at Advantage Gold. It's a fantastic seminar. They'll teach you how to take steps to help guard your wealth from inflation using asset diversification into physical precious metals. Gold and silver hold intrinsic value that should remain untouched by government manipulation. Folks, don't wait for the Fed's reckless policies to completely devalue the dollar and steal your life savings. Call now while free registration is open. I'm telling you, this is a fantastic seminar. Call 800-900-8000 right now. The Gold and Silver Summit could provide the vital insights we need to protect our families. 800-900-8000. Tell them Mark Levin sent you. Performance may vary. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Always consult your financial and tax professional. Says, like many unfortunate things, the rise of advocacy, at least in his surroundings, took off with Donald Trump at as many newsrooms. His election in 2016 was greeted at NPR with a mixture of disbelief, anger, and despair. Just to note, I eagerly voted against Trump twice, but felt we were obliged to cover him fairly. But what began as a tough, straightforward coverage of a belligerent, truth-impaired president veered toward efforts to damage or topple Trump's presidency. Persistent rumors that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia over the election became the catnip that drove reporting. At NPR, we hitched our wagon to Trump's most visible antagonist, Representative Adam Schiff. Schiff, who was the top Democrat on the House Intel Committee, became NPR's guiding hand, its ever-present muse. By my count, our hosts interviewed Schiff 25 times about Trump and Russia, And during many of those conversations, he alluded to purported evidence of collusion. And yet the shift talking points became the drumbeat of NPR news reports. When the Miller report found no credible evidence of collusion, NPR's coverage was notably sparse. Russiagate quietly faded by in our programming. I'll be right back. Attention, fellow Americans, Mark Levin here with a warning and a solution. I feel like our country is being destroyed by out-of-control spending and debt thanks to Biden and the American Marxists. 
And your hard-earned savings and retirement could be at risk from their socialist schemes. That's why you should consider Advantage Gold the best of the best, a U.S.-based company that specializes in helping everyday Americans protect their wealth. They have a simple solution to help you even potentially grow your wealth despite the attacks from Washington. I urge you to register for their upcoming Gold and Silver Summit. It's fabulous. A free online event where you'll learn tips to help safeguard your finances by diversifying into physical precious metals. Call 800 900 8000. Call them right now to sign up securely for this pivotal summit. It is crucial. Tell them Mark Levin sent you for a special bonus. Call 800 900 8000 right now. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. Mark Levin, the modern voice of the founding fathers. This is the Mark Levin Show. Dial in now at 877-381-3811. There's a magazine out there. What's it called? Talker's Magazine, Mr. Producer? Which is interesting because nobody ever talks about it. Most of you never heard of it. It's run by a fairly small group of individuals. And it relies heavily on advertising. I don't believe Cumulus advertises in the magazine. If it does, not that much. Some companies advertise more than others. It issues this list. These lists are so repulsive. With about 14 different disclaimers of the heavy 100 broadcasters. Did they survey audiences? No, that would cost too much, and that would be too accurate. They basically sit on their ass. Some of them work from home, some of them in an office. And they decide who the heavy 100 are. They decided that yours truly is number six. They decided that Dan Bongino is number 13. Where did they put our man Sid? I don't remember. Anyway, it's, it's a phony, phony list. Sid's 15. It's ridiculous. He's number one in New York. It's a phony list. By every metric, it's a phony list. If they like you and they know you, and if you're supportive of them, you move up the list. It's not even close. We're the second largest radio show in the United States. Hannity would tell you that. He's number one. One and two. There's nobody close to this show. That follows. That's not to say there aren't great shows. There are. That's not to say there aren't great syndicated shows. There are. One of them being my buddy Bongino. And same with, uh, well, I'm not going to start naming them. Same with a lot of them. But it really is repulsive. When they put together this list, they give it sort of a glitzy headline. Then they tell you 14 different ways that the list is not really an empirical decision. Mr. Producer, open your microphone. How many guests do we have to turn down every week? A lot. Scores. How many authors keep scratching at our door? Tons. For me to interview them? Tons. How many movements, ladies and gentlemen, have you and I led? from the Tea Party and other movements. The influence that you, in this audience, not me, you in this audience, the influence you have is enormous. It's enormous. This is the smartest audience and the most loyal audience. You. You're the most activist audience. That's you. How do we know? Because when we actually used to do research which most radio companies don't do anymore, but when we did, that's what they found. You're the most loyal, you're the smartest. And you're the second largest in the nation. Why? Because I'm on six to nine, that's why. People have other things to do. And nobody else can hold this slot like we do nationally. It's not possible. How do I know? Because they've tried. You and I have a special relationship. You don't want stupid on radio, and you don't want a conga line of guests on radio. You want... To know things, you want to learn things, you want to, you want a viewpoint on things, you want somebody who can defend them and not, and somebody who's going to 
in your homes, in your cars, in your businesses, wherever you are, in your trucks, to reinforce your belief system, your pro-American belief system. That's all lost on Talkers Magazine. They don't care. They don't know who you are. They know the foggiest idea. None. It's because of you and the audience that we're number one on Fox on the weekends. Prime time at night. Because of you. It's because of you and the audience. They're on the New York Times bestseller list. Ten books in a row. Number one, seven books in a row. That's you, not me. And I could go on and on and on. I don't have to prove a damn thing. But what I want to point out is that when people come out with these phony lists... They should be denounced. Michael Harrison in his Talkers magazine denounced for putting out what I would call propaganda. And in some cases, I think self-serving propaganda. There's no way Bongino's number 13. There's no way I'm six. But it doesn't matter. Bongino and I were texting earlier today. This is laughable. We laugh at these people. And we plow ahead. I don't know how much longer Talker's Magazine will be around when it spews out this stupid stuff. It's not the heavy 100. There's nothing heavy about the way they put their list together. It's purely opinion. Based on biases. Not based on any metrics that are measurable. None. Talker's Magazine. It's a fiction, as far as I'm concerned. Now, let me finish with what this gentleman was saying. I'm not going to read the whole piece, as it's very, very long. Yuri Berliner at the Free Press. I would encourage Barry Weiss and the rest of the Free Press, who've come to freedom a little late in life, but at least they've come to freedom. They understand the Democrat Party now. They understand the ideology, the American Marxists. They understand all of it. And they've been abused by these people. And smeared by these people. So welcome. Welcome. But it wouldn't hurt if you read a little, a little bit beyond your little inner circle. That's my view. Take it or leave it. So he writes, these are perilous times for news organizations. Last year, NPR laid off or bought, bought out 10% of its staff. Canceled four podcasts following a slump in advertising revenue. Our radio audience is dwindling and our podcast downloads are down from 2020. The digital stories on our website rarely have national impact. They aren't conversation starters. Our competitive advantage in audio, where for years NPR had no peers vanishing. There are plenty of informative and entertaining podcasts to choose from. Even with our diminished audience, there's evidence of trouble at the most basic level. Trust. That's right. Trust. Like Talkers Magazine, no trust. In February, our Audience Insights team sent an email proudly announcing that we had a higher trustworthy score than CNN and the New York Times. Pretty low bar. But the research from Harris Poll is hardly reassuring. It found that 3 in 10 audience members familiar with NPR said they associate NPR with the characteristic of trustworthiness. That's 30%. Only in a world where media credibility has completely imploded would a 3 in 10 trustworthy score be something to boast about. With declining ratings, sorry levels of trust, and an audience that has become less diverse over time, the trajectory for NPR is not promising. Two paths seem... Cl- it is promising. No, not the trajectory, but NPR has not gone anywhere because you and I help fund it. It's not a market system. It's donations and taxes. Donations and taxes. Big, fat, left-wing foundations prop it up. Big, fat government props it up. We don't get any of that, by the way. He says, two paths seem clear. We can keep doing what we're doing, hoping it will all work out, or we can start over with the basic building blocks of journalism. We could face up to where we've gone wrong. News organizations still go in for that kind of reckoning. But there's a good reason for NPR to be the first. We're the ones with the word public in our name. Despite our missteps at NPR, defunding isn't the answer. As the country becomes more fractured, there's still a need for a public institution. 
where stories are told and viewpoints exchanged in good faith. Defunding, as a rebuke from Congress, wouldn't change the journalism at NPR. That needs to come from within. (coughs) Says a few weeks ago, NPR welcomed welcomed a new CEO, Catherine Mayer, who's been a leader in tech. She doesn't have a news background, which could be an asset, given where things stand. I'll be rooting for her. It's a tough job. Her first rule could be simple enough. Don't tell people how to think. It could even be the new North Star. Yeah, right. Yuri, the problem is NPR is propaganda. And so are 95% of the rest of the American media. They're propaganda. They're propaganda for one party. You can read about it in full with the research, with the background, and unfreedom of the press and American Marxism. It's all laid out there, and it always has been. And it always has been. And I want to encourage our friends with... uh, conservative news platforms, you might want to check it out too, because none of this is a surprise. What's important about Yuri's piece, it's from an insider. That's why it's important. But when you look at CNN or MSNBC, these are organizations that are supported by multi-billion dollar globalist corporations. They don't even care about ratings. They could care less about ratings. They could care less about profitability. They're a pimple on an elephant's ass on these multi-corporate global businesses. And they keep them around to protect themselves. CNN will never trash AT&T and their ilk. MSNBC will never trash uh, Comcast and their ilk. And the story goes on and on and on. New York Times is owned 17% by the Wealthiest man in Mexico. And of course, the Washington Post never has to worry. Bezos owns the Washington Post. So these are entities that really do not respond to market demands. These are entities that are in the propaganda business for a one-party monopoly that they're seeking to build along with the Democrat Party. This is autocracy. Autocracy. It's not freedom of the press. When you look at what's been done to Donald Trump in the press, by the law, in the injustice system, it's really quite obvious to anybody who stands back and watches, except these doctrinaire, doctrinaire zombie leftists, what's taking place in this country. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. My fellow Americans, we're living in very perilous economic times. Washington seems determined to bankrupt our nation with endless stimulus spending. As they devalue our dollar, hardworking Americans like you could lose everything. That's why I urge you strongly, register for the upcoming Gold and Silver Summit hosted by our friends at Advantage Gold. They'll teach you how to help guard your wealth using asset diversification into physical precious metals. Gold and Silver can offer a defense against the dollar's devaluation, and the experts at Advantage Gold will explain how you can convert some of your savings into precious metals that can protect and potentially grow your wealth. With currency debasement from Washington and global uncertainty on the rise, gold and silver diversification could offer you some stability. Call 800-900-8000 right now to sign up. 800-900-8000 now. Tell them Mark Levin sent you. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. Hamas tells negotiators it doesn't have 40 Israeli hostages anymore. They said they're unable to identify and track them down. They murdered them. The Israelis said women and children first and the elderly. And they told them the 40 that need to come out first. We don't know where they are, says Hamas. Remember that 10-month-old baby who was taken hostage, Mr. Producer? Think that 10-month-old baby's alive? 
10-month-old baby needs a lot of care, loving attention. Milk, diapers. You think that's what they did for that 10-month-old baby? Joe Biden did an interview on Israel the other day, trashing Netanyahu, trashing Israel, trashing the IDF, giving more aid and comfort to the terrorists, giving actual money to the terrorists. Never mentioned the hostages once. Doesn't even mention the five American hostages. Where are they? Hamas told Qatar and Egypt it does not have 40 living hostages who match the criteria for release. They murdered them. If a courageous senator from the great state of Missouri, Ted Butt, he proposes legislation, pushes it hard on the floor of the Senate today, that would require Qatar, which is a loathsome terrorist organization that buys its way into Washington, D.C., buys its way into the Democrat and Republican Party, has put up $5 million for the Medal of Honor Memorial. This is what they do. Has golf tournaments and tennis tournaments, the likes of which Christopher Murphy, the disgusting, pathetic senator from Connecticut, attends. And he said that ties should be cut with Qatar unless they meet certain obligations. You know, we have these obligations for Israel now. We have obligations for Qatar. And yet Christopher Murphy objected. Senator of Connecticut. Who morally preens on MSNBC and CNN, trashing Trump all the time, trashing MAGA all the time. This guy's a punk He is a punk. He represents Hamas in the United States Senate. I don't want to hear the static. I don't want to hear the excuses and the footnotes. You're either for good or you're for evil. That man's for evil. Like his good friend Chris Van Hollen in Maryland. Another anti-Semite. That's right, I said it. Sue me. I'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post. Deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811. 877-381-3811. Cesar Chavez was the founder of the United Farm Workers Union as he sought to unionize mostly Mexican farm workers. Now, these Mexican farm workers were actually American citizens. American citizens. And he was supported by Ralph Abernathy, who became the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference after the assassination of Martin Luther King. He had been King's right-hand man. And he was supported by Walter Mondale, then the junior senator from Minnesota, Hubert Humphrey being the senior senator. He was supported by Eugene McCarthy, who later in life backed Ronald Reagan, was very solid in many respects, more libertarian than not. And, uh, well, something very interesting. His bust, if you will, was placed in Obama's Oval Office, and his bust remains in Joe Biden's Oval Office. And as I pointed out yesterday, Biden was interviewed at Univision by Enrique Acaradio. And uh, I want you to hear this. Cut one, go. I know you have the, the Cesar Chavez bus, which I wanted to oh, ask you about. 
Um, um. There it is. You know, when I was a uh, when I young, was a young senator, I was oh, actually senator. running for office, and I was 29 years old. And Delaware's largest industry is agriculture, and he was organizing farm workers in my mm -hmm. state, and I supported him, which was very controversial at the time in the southern part of my state. And uh, so I always admired him because he was all about fairness and decency. I mean, he really was about just, we talked about values, basic values. Family values. Family values. You know, he had fake. nothing to do with uh, Cesar Chavez and organizing anything. He's a nut. But some years ago, we reached way back, didn't we, Mr. Producer? And on public TV, on KQED, I believe that's the San Francisco area. We retrieved an interview with Cesar Chavez. And I want you to listen to this. Cut to go. Uh, we maintain that agriculture is different. It's always been different. This is why agriculture and farm workers were never organized before. As long as we have a poor country uh, bordering California, it's going to be very difficult to win strikes uh, as strikes are won uh, normally by other unions. Uh, we have an employer, as is the case right now in one of the strikes we have with the, with the Butte Gas and Oil Company, where we've closed them down, then have been unable to get uh, strike breakers, or we've gotten very few, and then all of a sudden yesterday morning, uh, they brought in 220 uh, wetbacks. They wait, 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 did he say wetbacks, Mr. Producer? They brought in 220 wetbacks? This is... Cesar Chavez said that? Oh, he said that and a hell of a lot more during the course of his life about illegal aliens, illegal alien Mexicans coming into our country and undermining American Mexican citizens who he was trying to organize. Go ahead. Mexico. Now, there's no way to defend against that kind of strike breaking. And so they, therefore the only way to win strikes is by then taking our, our fight to the, to the citizens, to the uh, people in the city especially, and have them help us um, boycott those products that we're striking, and uh, we need that. And that's the only way we've been able to get contracts, and I, I venture to say that without that, we couldn't possibly organize unions. So illegal aliens, who he called wetbacks, were undermining their ability to get fair wages and conditions for American Mexican citizens. And it goes beyond that if you read Liberty and Tyranny in the immigration chapter, you, the smartest audience of audiences, not people who host and so forth, you. He organized nighttime sort of militia that will watch the border for illegal aliens from Mexico coming into the country and then they would report them to the authorities to try and keep them out of the country. Cesar Chavez was tr trying to protect American citizens of Mexican ancestry. He rejected this idea of legal, illegal immigration. He rejected this idea of an open border. Period. And at the time he was supported by the Democrat Party in doing so. Because they saw it as undermining unions. Today, of course, the Democrat Party pretends to be pro-union, but is pro-illegal alien in ways we've never even comprehended before. So Joe Biden has the bust of Cesar Chavez in his office. Univision doesn't want you to know the truth about Cesar Chavez, the things he said about illegal aliens, and the fact that he was, in many ways, pro-American citizen. And the media don't want you to know that either. They lie through their teeth, these bastards. They just do. And there's Joe Biden with a bust of a man in his office. They called them wetbacks. What do you think Cesar Chavez would be saying today about Joe Biden and the conditions on the border? What do you think he'd be saying today? It's just like Martin Luther King. Forget about Martin Luther King. Now it's Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a Marxist. Okay, great. Martin Luther King was no Marxist. 
He was a Christian who loved his country and wanted to fix it, not destroy it. There's a difference. So colorblind society is now out, and racism and segregation is now in, just different people switching roles. And this is the official position of the Biden administration, just as the official position of the Democrats was the other edge, the other end. But it's never about a colorblind society. It's never about individual merit. It's never about any of these things when it comes to the Democrat Party. So I'll play it one more time because some of you may not have heard it or maybe you were like, what, who was that? What did he say? This is Cesar Chavez, 1972. The bust of whom Joe Biden has in his office. And notice, Biden always talks about himself. Asked about Cesar Chavez, Biden talks about how he supported the movement. No, he didn't. Asked about Mandela, Biden talks about how he He marched and got arrested in South Africa. No, he didn't. He's 29 years old. He was a punk. Never had a real private sector job. He served on the Wilmington City Council. He got elected there when he was 25 or 26. He was not at the forefront of anything. Nothing. Nothing. Well, let's go through it again. Let's start cut number one, Joe Biden on Cesar Chavez. Go ahead. I know you have the, the Cesar Chavez bus, which I wanted to oh, ask you about. Um, um. There it is. You know, when I was a, uh, when I was a young senator, I was actually running for office. Yeah. And I was 29 years old, and Delaware's largest industry is agriculture. And he was organizing farm workers in my state. And I supported him. Which was very controversial at no, the time. No, you didn't. He didn't do anything. He's a liar. Go ahead. And mostly, by the way, Cesar Chavez was focused mostly in California, almost exclusively. Go ahead. Part of my state. And uh, so I always admired him because he was all about fairness and decency. I mean, he really was about just, we talked about values, basic values, family values, family values, you know, faith. Family. Cesar Chavez said things about illegal aliens. You know, they attacked Trump that Donald Trump never even dreamt of. And he viewed them as the enemy of American Mexican citizens in this country and of the farm laborers in this country. He viewed them as the enemy. And as I said, he would have his members. <coughs> Excuse me, cholera. He would have his members stand watch at the border, or parts of the border, particularly with California and Mexico, and report illegal immigration to the authorities and help round them up. That's the bust that Joe Biden has in his office. You know, Cesar Chavez would be repulsed by this open border, just as Martin Luther King would be repulsed by critical race theory and DEI and all the rest. That's not what he fought for. That's not what he died for. That's not what Chavez fought for. They fought for an equal break. Now Chavez again, 1972, oddly enough, the year that Senator, excuse me, Joe Biden ran for the Senate and first won about six weeks later. Cut to go. Uh, we maintain that agriculture is different. It's always been different. This is why agriculture and farm workers were never organized before. As long as we have a poor country uh, bordering California, it's going to be very difficult to win strikes uh, as strikes are won uh, normally by other unions. Uh, we have an employer, as is the case right now in one of the strikes we have with the, with the Butte Gas and Oil Company, where we've closed them down. They have been unable to get uh, strike breakers, or we've gotten very few. And then all of a sudden, yesterday morning, uh, they brought in 220 uh, wetbacks. These are the illegals from Mexico. Now, there's no there way to There you go. That's enough. Them. The wetbacks, the illegals from Mexico. He said it. I didn't. He said it. And we have, of course, Cesar Chavez Day. But they rewrite his whole history. They rewrite things that he said. They rewrite things that he did. 
But now you know. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Nowadays, 20 bucks barely gets you a burger and fries and maybe a quarter tank of gasoline. You know what it will get you, though? For just $20 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data from my cell phone company, Pure Talk. You'll get the same quality of service as AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can trade your phone or get great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Make the switch today and save an additional 50% off your first month. Choose a wireless company that shares our values, that supports our military and veterans, that creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Instead, they're right here with us. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch right now so you can actually afford that burger and fries. That's puretalk.com slash Levin. In L E V I N. During the break, I was, first of all, trying to find a copy of Liberty and Tyranny around here somewhere, and I found it. Then digging into the section on immigration to more fully describe to you what Cesar Chavez and the others were up to, but unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to pull it off. But it's in there. It's in that chapter, if anybody gives a damn. A few people do. The Democrat Party destroyed our immigration system starting in 1965 uh, when they passed a law that uh, changed the entire scope and system. Here it is. You have people like Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote a book called The Disuniting of America who was a liberal Harvard professor who worked very closely with Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson uh, and defended them very strongly. But it was gravely concerned about our immigration system <clears throat> and how it was being used to destroy the unity of the country. If a man, Theodore White, most of you never heard of him, but he was extremely well known. He was an author who wrote about every presidential election was quite liberal, quite liberal. And he said, he wrote that the Immigration Act of 1965 changed all previous patterns, and in so doing probably changed the future of America. It was noble, revolutionary, and probably the most thoughtless of the many acts of the great society. Imagine what Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and Theodore White would be saying today about Joe Biden and the Democrat Party. Imagine. In the 1960s, Cesar Chavez, one of the founders of the United Farm Workers Union, vehemently opposed illegal immigration, arguing it undermined his efforts to unionize farm workers and improve working conditions and wages for American citizen workers. The UFW even reported illegal immigrants to the Immigration and Naturalization Service. In 1969, Chavez led a march, accompanied by Ralph Abernathy, president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Senator Walter Mondale, Eugene McCarthy, and others, along the southern border with Mexico, protesting the farmers' use of illegal immigrants. But most unions soon change course, and today they lobby to confer amnesty and ultimately citizenship on illegal aliens. That includes the American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations, AFL-CIO, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Farm Labor Organizing Committee, Hotel Employees and Restaurant Employees International Union, Laborers International Union of North America, Service Employees International Union. You want to know why? They've sold out the American citizen. That's why. And they figure illegal aliens are potential members. They view the large influx of both legal and illegal immigrants as a new source of political clout that favors their allies in the Democrat Party and potentially adds membership to their own dwindling numbers. They came to the same realization as historian Samuel Lubell, who noted that the voting age children of the first great generation constituted the big city masses who furnished the votes 
which re-elected Franklin Roosevelt again and again, and in the process ended the traditional Republican majority in the country. That's exactly what's going on. People know this. Scholars know it. Politicians know it. But you're not allowed to talk about it. And yet there's Cesar Chavez. Who said what he said. You heard it. That was his mouth to your ears. Alejandro Mayorkas. He was the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security under Obama, and of course he's the Secretary now, and this is the way it works in the Biden administration. It's the Obama administration, effectively, again. Mayorkas is of Cuban heritage. He comes from a very wealthy family. And he is a pathological liar. He is a pathological liar. And I am sick and tired of people like Mitt Romney and other bastards. That's what I said. Who say, what's the impeachable offense? What's the high crime? I've explained it over and over. It's available for anybody to understand and read. Today we even have the internet for a lazy bastard like Romney to get on there and figure it out himself. There's books that have been written about it. This is a high crime and misdemeanor. When you create what the framers talked about, a political crime. Not a violent crime or a crime in the criminal code, a crime against society. In other words, when you let millions and millions of people cross that border, fentanyl killing 100,000 Americans a year, sex slavery like we haven't seen since after the Civil War, and there is Romney, a very wealthy man who inherited a great deal of money, sitting there saying, I don't see the high crime. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't because you're blind. You're busy marching with BLM, a Marxist, racist, anti-Semitic organization. You are blind. Today he admitted, yes, we have a crisis on the border. Let me tell you what's going on when we come back. Another sleazy political move by Biden is in the works. You can smell it. The stench is heavy in the air, and I'll explain it. We'll be right back. Nowadays, 20 bucks barely gets you a burger and fries and maybe a quarter tank of gasoline. You know what it will get you, though? For just $20 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data from my cell phone company, Pure Talk. You'll get the same quality of service as AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can trade your phone or get great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Make the switch today and save an additional 50% off your first month. Choose a wireless company that shares our values, that supports our military and veterans, that creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Instead, they're right here with us. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch right now so you can actually afford that burger and fries. That's puretalk.com slash Levin. In L-E-V-I-N. Nobody says it better than Mark Levin. I'll go with what Mark Levin said, because nobody could say it better. Call in now at 877-381-3811. Yes, we be here, America. So what's Biden doing? Well, you have to keep in mind, Biden is a sleazeball. And he will do anything for power. He'll do anything to retain power putting his political opponent in prison. That process is starting next week, if you can believe it or not, by a loathsome radical left-wing Soros prosecutor, a loathsome Democrat hack state-elected judge by a Manhattan jury, which is a jury of Joe Biden's peers on 34 counts, which are outrageous on their face. They just need a guilty. This one guilty count. That's all they want. And so the whole debate will be about that. Prison sentence. And Joe Biden hopes to skate. Even more, he hopes that... He hopes that Trump will wind up in prison so he's actually running against nobody. Joe Biden will do anything for power. He has been working with ultra-radical leftists in Israel. Lapid. Gantz, others, 
to overthrow Bibi Netanyahu because Bibi Netanyahu wants to save his people and save his country. Even though Blinken wants to throw them all under the bus for Hamas and Iran. But Netanyahu is not going to go, and he's certainly not going to go quietly. Neither is Trump. These are the two great leaders in the world right now, Trump and Netanyahu. Biden is a rash on the body politic of America and most other countries. The terrorists are rooting for Biden in this election. The communist Chinese, the fascistic Russians in Cuba, in Venezuela, they're all rooting for Biden. They've never seen anything like it. A guy who destroys his own country from within and actually funds terrorism, actually funds communist China with oil sales that Iran is making to China. Funds Iran that provides drones to Russia to try and destroy Ukraine. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. Even our enemies are going, geez, what the hell did we do to deserve this? But the border now, after three and a half years of lawlessness, after three and a half years, I'm not giving a damn of what happens to the women and children sold into slavery and pornography, not giving a damn about the fentanyl and 100,000 citizens a year dying from it, not giving a damn about enriching the drug cartels and the communist Chinese to boot. Now something interesting is happening. The socialist president of Mexico, who demanded that we, the American citizens, pay his country retributions. Remember that clown? He sent his army out to stop, if, to slow, if not stop, the flow of illegal immigrants into the United States. Did you hear that, Mr. Producer? And Joe Biden is now pondering possible executive action to stop the flow of illegal immigrants into the country. See, Joe Biden wants to do just enough where he can run campaign commercials that he fixed the border that, that Trump broke and to muscle through the election. He will do anything. He will say anything. That's why he's raising hundreds and hundreds. He's going to raise a billion dollars in his campaign like we've never seen before, funded by billionaires and corporatists. Billionaires and corporatists. You see, the billionaires and the corporatists They have a great thing going with a big, centralized, ubiquitous federal government. It's it's really great. So many of these billionaires, not all, of course, but so many of them are billionaires because of government, because of government regulations, because of a lack of actual competition. And that's fine by Joe Biden. If they donate to him or they support him, he will do anything for them. It's fine by him. I'm a capitalist, but... He is. He's a capitalist, B-U-T-T. He's a butt. This man has never lived in the world of capitalism. He's never developed anything. He's never created anything. He's never had to actually achieve anything in the private sector. Not with his brain, not with his brawn, not with anything. He's a conniver. He's a manipulator. He's a deceiver. He's a propagandist. He's one of the best of the loathsome politicians we've had. He gets elected from a small state, and he seeks to impose his will on the entire nation. He's one of the dumbest men to ever be in the Oval Office, as he was one of the dumbest men to ever be vice president, as he was one of the dumbest men to ever be senator. The data proves that out. History proves that out. His own history. And so he's going to uh, continue to get the help of the socialist government in Mexico because they fear Donald Trump. They fear that wall. Suddenly he's going to figure out there are executive orders he can use, and he's, he's concerned that they, they be upheld. That's why it's taken him so long to do this, you see, America. He's not concerned about his illegal violations of the Constitution in the Supreme Court when it comes to student loan forgiveness. He doesn't worry about the niceties of the laws then. Or the niceties of the laws when it came to federal health bureaucrats determining what tenants should pay landlords on rent, which the court also said was unconstitutional. But he went ahead and did it anyway. He's not worried about that. He's not worried about the multiple 
federal immigration laws that he violates day in and day out. No, no, no. But all of a sudden, he wants to make sure if he issues an executive order that, you know, it'll, it'll withstand scrutiny. This is the man six months ago he said he would defend Israel no matter what, who now is stabbing that country in the back over and over and over again so he can get the vote of the Islamists in Dearborn, Michigan and other parts of the country. That's right. Let's be blunt. Let's tell the truth. You know, he pretends that he was some great civil rights leader. He pretends that he was there with Hugo Chavez, that he was there with Mandela, that he was here, that he was there, when in fact he was standing with four white racist segregationists. And they all, we all know it. The media know it. But they like what he does because they hate the country too. Because they hate the country too. My Arcus. I want to help some of my friends on TV and elsewhere who say, how can you hold my Arcus to account and impeach him and not the President of the United States? They're not mutually exclusive. You're not required to impeach both. Wouldn't bother me if they did. But it's a matter of practicality. They wouldn't have the votes to impeach Biden. But that doesn't mean you give my Arcus a pass. My Arcus has lied repeatedly to committees of Congress in both chambers. Repeatedly. He's deceived the American people repeatedly. Repeatedly. Impeachment applies not just to a president or a vice president, it also applies to cabinet secretaries as well as other officers of the government. So is the argument you either impeach the president or nobody? Is that what the Constitution says? No, of course not. But I want you to hear Romney on Capitol Hill, and this is why the Republicans have a problem. This is why. You have people like Romney, stupid, and yet self-aggrandizing. Cut six, go. I think there's no question but that uh, this is not going to uh, result in a conviction. Okay, let's uh, stop. Uh, what, what, what impeachment of a major figure has ever resulted in a conviction? Former judges, yes. Yes. But we've had impeachments of presidents that didn't result in conviction because it's a high bar. So we know there's not going to be conviction. That doesn't mean you don't go through the process. But go ahead. The test of a high crime or misdemeanor being committed has not been alleged, and as a result of that, uh, there will not be a conviction. No, that's not why. Because all the Democrats will vote no, and that will put an end to it. doesn't matter. And punks like you will also vote no. You won't have enough senators. You won't have a supermajority to vote yes. That's why. Don't say that's not why there will be a conviction, because he hasn't committed a high crime or misdemeanor. Mr. Producer, invite Mitt Romney on the program. We'll go through the exercise again to discuss what a high crime and misdemeanor is. I'm quite serious. Specifically, what is a high crime and misdemeanor? What did the framers mean when they spent second amount as much time on the impeachment issue? The first most amount of time they spent was on this office of the presidency, what it should look like. But they spent a lot of time on this impeachment issue. Raul Berger's written about it. Former the late Professor Charles Allen has written about it. You can actually go to original sources and read about it, something Mark does and did. And so I want Mitt Romney to educate me. I want to know where he gets his information from, what his thought process is. If this isn't a high crime and misdemeanor, then what is? Then what is? And I looked at the impeachment articles. They are rock solid. Absolutely rock solid. So in the case of Mitt Romney, he just doesn't want to do it. He's on the way out. Maybe his business has benefited heavily from illegal immigration. I'm not accusing him. I don't know. But this is a man that threw in with Black Lives Matter before he even knew what they stood for. Didn't matter. It was the group of the day. Marxist, anti-Semitic, BDS group. And crooked as hell. Stealing money from people. And deceiving black people. But there was Romney marching with them. 
But when it comes to impeaching Mayorkas, who's lied to Congress repeatedly, lied to the American people repeatedly, who's the head of the department that's supposed to secure the border. I mean, if Mayorkas would say, look, I wanted to secure the border, but I was told not to, that would be a different story. But instead, he lied on behalf of the administration. And let me help some of my friends, some of these hosts also who raise, well, if you're going to impeach Mayorkas, shouldn't you also impeach Biden? The way the executive branch often works is that the cabinet secretary has an enormous amount of influence on White House policy. And so Mayorkas will have his opportunity to explain that this time he was just following orders. You know, like the Nuremberg trials, just following orders. And no, I'm not comparing it to Nazi Germany. I'm comparing the argument, just following orders, how bogus it is. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Nowadays, 20 bucks barely gets you a burger and fries and maybe a quarter tank of gasoline. You know what it will get you, though? For just $20 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data from my cell phone company, Pure Talk. You'll get the same quality of service as AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can trade your phone or get great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Make the switch today and save an additional 50% off your first month. Choose a wireless company that shares our values, that supports our military and veterans, that creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Instead, they're right here with us. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch right now so you can actually afford that burger and fries. That's puretalk.com slash Levin. N L E V I N. Where am I, Mr. Producer? What would you have me do? Here we are. Biden's out there on a campaign, not against the Islamo Nazi who runs Iran, not against the Islamo Nazis that run Hamas, not against the Islamo Nazis that run the Houthi terrorist organization, not against the Islamo Nazis that. Run Hezbollah. No, 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 no. He's focused exclusively on the Jewish leader of the Jewish state, Netanyahu. Character assassinating him. Because this is all Biden knows. This is what he did as a senator. To one judicial nominee after another who he did not support. He sought and received information and tried to use it to smear them, to character assassinate them. This is a loathsome, loathsome man. This is an evil man. He's trying to imprison Donald Trump. He's trying to depose an elected leader of Israel and replace him with a lapdog who will do the bidding of this administration, the Iranians, and Palestinian terrorists. He's lit the Middle East on fire. He's lit our southern border on fire. What's next? The longer he stays in office the longer our enemies are poised to attack both within and outside the United States. Let's be honest. I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. I'm going to be gone for a few days, not to be forgotten. I will be back next week. I'm going on a mission. I don't know how wise this mission is under the circumstances, but I'm going on a mission. And I'm going on this mission for you, my radio audience. I'm not sure how specific I should be, because it could get dangerous, Mr. Producer, don't you agree? So, I'm going to go on a mission 
I'm going to leave my home around 3, 3.30 a.m. in the morning. And I will be back next week, relatively early next week, give or take a day, depending on how the mission goes. In fact, I won't be able to broadcast on this mission. But when I do come back, I will have a tremendous amount to share with you. As I say, I'm doing this for you, my audience. And especially the radio audience. And I don't like to draw attention to myself. I don't like to do things with a lot of fanfare. Look at me, look at me. Uh, As I say, I'm going on a mission. Now, this show has a massive audience, not just in terrestrial radio, on podcasting, on YouTube, on the Mark Levin app, on the iHeartRadio app, Sirius Satellite, live streaming. We're on many, many platforms, probably too many, but we're on a lot of platforms for anybody who wants to hear this program whether you're sitting at your desk or you're using your iPhone or Android or at a laptop, you're in your car listening to Sirius Satellite, Sirius XM, whatever. But these are technologies that carry the program far beyond the boundaries of America. We've had callers in the past from Ireland, from Great Britain, from France, from Canada, from Israel, from all over the world. All over the world. This program is streamed, satellited, I'll invent that word, however you want to put it, all these technologies have been put to use to maximize its reach. We are probably on more platforms than any other radio host. Some radio hosts are purely on radio and they look at their ratings and so forth. We're on radio, that's the mothership. But we also embrace technology. So radio is the mothership and we use other platforms to get the message out. I am mission oriented, that's what I do. That's what I do. You know that's what I do. You've been with me for over 20 years. And I try and bring knowledge and information to you that is unique and really needs to be. Because when you're on 6 to 9 on the East Coast, you've already heard morning hosts, afternoon hosts, late afternoon hosts. Maybe there'll be a nighttime host. Look, I'm a talk radio junkie. I don't listen to it like I used to, but as a kid I did, as a young adult I did. I love it. And I always will. And I'll always do my best to support it. But there are technologies out there that we maximize. On the internet. On satellite. On live streaming and all the rest. And I remember when Rush once told me, no, I'm just doing terrestrial radio. No podcast, no YouTube, not the rest of it. That's going to be the focus. And he was right. For him, the king. For me, the more platforms, the better. That's my view. And for our sponsors too, by the way. Without whom this show wouldn't even be possible. See, we actually do believe in capitalism. We don't get any money from the government or non-profit organization, whatever it is. No, we don't have any big donors, you know, like Mediaite, Media Matters, and all that. No, it's you and me, the American people. It's between us. It's among us. When we go on this mission, uh, I will report back to you in full. And I'm not undercover. I'm not working for the CIA or anything like that, nor do I care to or ever would. 
but I don't want to make a big show. Oh, look at this. It's Mark Levin. Who's he? I don't need all that. I don't want all that. That's not why I'm doing what I'm going to do. You'll understand more when I report back. You'll understand more. My kids don't want me to go on this mission right now, Mr. Producer. I can't say I blame them, can you? But I am. And I'm proud of it. And I'm happy to do it. And I'm not trying to be coy or secretive or anything of the sort. I also do not want to project to anybody and everybody in the area and the place where I'm headed that I'm going there. So just so you know, you can make a guess. You're probably right, but that's not the point. So I wanted to point that out to you because you and I, we have a relationship. We have a connection, I think, like very few hosts and audiences. Representative Jonathan Jackson, Democrat of Illinois, Jonathan Jack. Now, no, no, people don't know who the hell this is, but he's a liar. And John Roberts is a hell of a reporter. He really is great. As a matter of fact, you look at these Fox reporters. You look at Martha. Oh, man, I don't want to go down the list, but they have a hell of a lot. Brits, great. Um, and John Roberts, lady co-host, her name just escapes me, but I think she's terrific. I, ju- I apologize. It's just because I've been sick for four days and my mind isn't what it ought to be. So I'm exhausted. <clears throat> but she's fantastic, too. There's just, there's just so many. And you know what? Dana Perino. Shame on me. Either she's become more conservative or my eyes have opened more. But she has been absolutely terrific. Sandra Smith. I love Sandra Smith. Even Gutfeld. Remember when Gutfeld was first on Fox and I detested him, Mr. Producer? Remember that? I used to slap him around on the radio all the time because he was just another never Trumper and so forth. But he's fantastic. He really is a a very rare combination of humor and substance and very, very intriguing ideas, I think. Our buddy Jesse Waters. But I'm not going to go through the whole list. My man, Sean Hannity. God bless Sean Hannity. But anyway, Jonathan Jackson on Fox News yesterday and John Roberts sets him straight. Hat tip, Breitbart, cut seven, go. And then we saw what happened when Haitians tried to come to the United States. They were met with whips and chains from like a bygone era and wait, turned away. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. The, the, you're talking about the rains and the Border Patrol? <laughs> we those, saw, those, those, we saw was, some of the people on horses those are, turning, those, turning, those, turning back to Haitians. But they, but they weren't whipping them, Congressman. No, That's but, been but investigated. I'm, I'm, I'm saying they were on a horse that looked like they, they were, were chasing their, people. They were twirling their reins to try to keep folks away from well, the that horses. Well, that was a far, a far cry from give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses that yearn to breathe free. That's why we're dealing with stupidity. Yeah, give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses that yearn to be free. People who said that, people who wrote that, people who chiseled it into the granite, they hate them too because, you know, some of them own slaves. Now, that's something to hate, don't get me wrong, but they also founded a nation that could correct itself, that can improve itself. Most countries don't work that way. And so we have a, we're in a country that fought against itself to end slavery. I shouldn't even put it that way. We have a Republican Party that fought a Democrat Party to end slavery. But Jackson's throwing around, you know, fortune cookie lines and so forth. And it was uh, Roberts who said, well, well, wait a minute. You want to know why? Because Jonathan Jackson hates America. He wants to believe the worst. He wants you to believe the worst. Biden's out there trashing Netanyahu in front of the prime minister of Japan. On Univision, I've never seen anything like this. And now I want you to hear Claire McCaskill. Claire McCaskill is a slob. She lost her Senate seat 
because people in Missouri detest her. And she's on MSLSD, you know, for a cheap nickel here and there. The reason they're all on MSLSD. You have to fill out a form. You cannot have an IQ, an IQ higher than 17. And honestly, Mr. Producer, you have to look like you were hit by a bus. And she fits that description perfectly, as do most of the people on MSLSD. I'm not even going to play it. She's trashing Netanyahu, a one-man wrecking ball. Here's a guy, the Churchill of the Middle East of Israel, defending his nation and doing it effectively. There's Nicole Wallace, same network. Trump is running as an autocrat, full stop. Yeah, low IQ, low IQ moron. Republican Party, formerly hack. And oddly enough, the Democrats... Favorite lawyer, the imprisoned Michael Avenatti, who Brian Stelter wanted to run for president. Remember? Remember what an iconic figure he was? MSLSD says, why don't we interview Michael Avenatti from prison and get his view on the New York trial against Donald Trump? And then something weird happened. Something weird happened. Listen, cut 13, go. You know, I, I think the, the case has a lot of problems. Now, that, that does not, I don't mean to suggest that that means that Trump will not be convicted, because I think he will be convicted, hmm. because, number, because number one, he's a criminal defendant, and in our society, I don't believe that criminal defendants generally get a fair shake. In fact, I think that the percentage of convictions demonstrates that, that the deck is stacked decidingly against all criminal defendants. Um, number one. Number two, I don't think that he can get a fair trial in New York. And to the people who claim that, in fact, he can get a fair trial in New York with a New York jury, I would ask them if they were to sleep, go to sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow and find out that the case had been moved to Mississippi or Alabama, would they still think that the trial was going to be fair? And I think if they were being honest, they would answer no. So, wow. Um, wow. I don't think they'll be interviewing Avenatti from prison again. Do you, Mr. Producer? This guy was cocky. He was an ignoramus. A proven crook. A Trump hater. So he was embraced by the media. They promoted him. They created him. Now he's in prison for multiple years. But even he sees that it is impossible for Donald Trump to get a fair trial. In this jurisdiction, Manhattan, with a Joe Biden jury, it's just not possible. And this judge is a grotesque example of a political hack in a black robe who should never be called your honor because he does nothing but a dishonor to our judicial system. There's many flaws in this case, including constitutional flaws. How in the hell can a local DA effectively charge a president on federal offenses? Because that's what he's using. That's what he needs. And how can a local DA interfere in a federal presidential election? And once this thing is challenged and gets to the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court rules in favor of what's taking place in New York, our, our nation will never be the same. We have 15,000 district attorneys. Tens of thousands of assistant district attorneys. We have almost 100 U.S. attorneys' offices. Thousands of assistant U.S. attorneys. But back to the local and state. These people are elected by one party or another. And if they have the power to concoct a legal case against a presidential candidate and to get a conviction in a jurisdiction that voted overwhelmingly for his opponent by a prosecutor who was installed by a person like George Soros, by a judge who is a political hack whose daughter has been raising money off the case. The nation will never be the same again. Never.
Never. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Kamala Harris. Cut 14, go. I don't think it's hyperbolic to say this genuinely could be the last Democratic election we ever have. You're right. Listen to what he says. Ah, Shut up, you two morons. I will bet Kamala Harris, if Donald Trump wins, I'll bet her $25 million that it won't be the last election we have. Didn't they write that I'm worth $50 million, Mr. Producer? 50? Or was it 150? I was offended. 50 million? Well, then I'll take 25 million of my 50 million. And I will bet Kamala Harris. You got 24 hours, Kamala. $25 million. That there will be democracy if Donald Trump wins. That is, there will be a democratic election. Four years later, put your money where your big mouth is. And by the way, you can have Soros funded, too. I'll be right back. He's driving the media mad. Mark Levin, call in with your outrage. 877-381-3811. What's that magazine called again? Seriously. Talker's Magazine? I understand it's number 17. On the radio industry list of publications, Mr. Peter. Not even in the heavy 10. It's in the butt heavy bottom half of the top 20. So it's official, ladies and gentlemen, using the same standards that Michael Harrison at the Talkers Magazine has used. My group and I, Mr. Producer, Mr. Call Screener, the homeless guy in the corner, we have decided. That Talkers Magazine is number 17 in terms of influence and importance in the talk industry, and I believe there's only like 10 of them. So he's number 17. Good job, Michael. What a putz. Where am I? Oh, what do you want, Mr. Producer? Oh. Let's go to some of our callers, shall we? Yes, we can. Jill. Jill. Palm Beach, Florida, the great WJNO, home of our buddy, Mr. Mudd, who we love here in the, in the bunker. Brian Mudd, go right ahead. Hi. Um, you know, they're trying to tell us to push all of Trump's trials to go before the election. Well, it looks like the New York one is going to go. I remember you saying a very long time ago that a defendant has a right to switch lawyers, fire their lawyers. Now, I'm not saying he's unhappy, but if he was yes. and he hired a new lawyer, wouldn't he have to go through all the evidence? Thus, the trial wouldn't happen anytime soon. Well, he ought to try it. Some judges would say, okay, fine. you got 30 days or 15 days or whatever it is. Or the judge might say, this is a subterfuge, but who cares what the judge says? Um, I'm sure his lawyers are superb, by the way, but I would do that. I would do whatever you have to do. You're up against these totalitarian uh, uh, of uh, courts and the prosecutors and judges. You know, these are Potemkin courthouses, as I call them. But they're fake. Go ahead, Joe. Absolutely, they are. I was just going to say that, you know, anything the judge, you know, says, you know, they can just say, well, everything my lawyers have put before you, you've rejected. So how good no, all he has to be? say, he doesn't even have to give a reason other than he's not happy with them. But you make a great... Are you a lawyer, Jill? No, I've just been thinking about Jill, it. Jill, you thinking. should have been a lawyer. Lawyer Jill. I can see it now, can't you? <laughs> I'm serious. That's a great um, point. Yeah, I just... <coughs> thank you. You'll tell him? Well, he hears it. He knows. He's already aware of this. Yeah, no, I'm sure he already does, but I don't. All right, I'll tell him, President Trump. Do. You ought to think about doing this. I'm sure his lawyers are thinking about it. They're actually pretty good. Jill, thank you very much. Good yuntif. Let's go to Michelle Fountain in South Carolina, the great WVOC. That sounds like a cool place. Where is that? Uh, just outside of Greenville, South Carolina. 
Oh, very cool. Well, how are you? I'm I'm doing great. Just just frustrated as all get out as I go along with yeah. these things. But my question to you, frustrated and trying to get through is. We see a president who is definitely a traitor to our country. I don't understand we are forming. There's got to be people out there who can help us get together and form. I thought we were supposed to be able to defend our country against all terrorism, both foreign and domestic. I think he's the most domestic. No, no, no. The president is supposed to protect us from enemies, foreign and domestic. That's his oath. Well, I... And the only way to remove him is through impeachment and conviction or to defeat him at the ballot box. So... To answer your question, he will not be removed by impeachment. He will not be removed by any extra constitutional means. We have a constitutional process. Now, the question is whether more of us will turn out than more of them. The question is whether our lawyers have now sharpened up and understand the tactics of the left-wing lawyers and are going to take them on and are going to outsmart them and outwit them. I want you to remember something. All you see or mostly these national polls, or you see polls, you know, in these various battleground states and so forth, you win by the Electoral College, which is why the Democrats hate it. They want basically 11 states to decide who the president is. And I'll give you an example. In Nebraska, Charlie Kirk has been leading this effort to have winner take all in the Electoral College. They've been giving one Electoral College vote to each congressional district, and since Omaha is Democrat, fairly liberal, not everybody, but the majority, a Republican president wins Nebraska, but that Electoral College vote goes to the Democrat. And Maine does the same thing, but Maine, you know, Maine is, is much more uh, unpredictable, but Nebraska is not. So you could have a situation where you're down, you got to have your 270 Electoral College votes, where we can, we're down in a close election to 270 to 268, and because Nebraska gave its, didn't have winner take all like most of the rest of the states, and gave one to the Democrats, we lose. So there's an effort afoot, and we've participated this in this on this program uh, to persuade the governor of Nebraska to have a special um, session of the legislature to vote on this and change it. And I'm told by Charlie Kirk that he now has agreed to do that. Uh, We have placed that on our social platforms. And if we can do that, that's an example of the sort of things that we need to do. We need to be smart about. And hopefully that will be accomplished. So there's things we can do. There's things we better do. And I always say, we are an army of 75 million people. That's how many people voted for Trump. And I'll bet there's more of us now. We don't have to take this. If you work the polls on election day, if you call 10 people, if you are a precinct worker, if you have a little extra cash and you donate it to Trump's campaign or to a conservative in the running for the Senate, there are things you can do. There are Tea Party movements. There's uh, convention of state movements. They're all around us. There's parental movements. There are people who want to save the country. But if we're hoping for things that are never going to happen, we're going to lose. But thank you for your outstanding call, Michelle. Let us continue, shall we? I think we shall. Mike, Detroit, Michigan. WJR, the great WJR. Mike, how are you? Well, good. I'm doing, I'm doing well. You know, I live in Detroit, and three blocks away, there was a constituency of the Democratic Party, you know, uh, Omar Tlaib and so on, chanting death to America. And people need to understand who these constituencies are that really make the decisions when it comes to the policy, this horrendous foreign policy and domestic policy of the Democratic Party. You know, if you look at crime, there's three constituencies that are responsible for this. And that is the open border constituency, the restorative justice constituency, and uh, the community activist constituency, you know, handcuffing the police. But there's, there's these horrible, horrible constituencies that really are the sum of the Democratic Party. But, uh, you know, it's hard for ordinary... Can I citizens- ask you a question, Mike? Seriously. If I were to walk through Dearborn, Michigan, and it became known who I am, would I be safe? Uh, I don't know, you know, but I would, I can tell you one thing, that during the horrendous uh, attacks in Europe... 
terrorist attacks in Europe, there were a couple of religious leaders in Dearborn that were censored because they were encouraging these attacks. You know, uh, they, they... That seems they, to me the they, FBI ought to open a, a field office in Dearborn, Michigan. You keep having people promoting terrorists and terrorism. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, terrorists like the Kud movement. The Islamo-Nazi that runs Iran and keeps threatening us. Uh, talks about destroying America. Uh, it seems to me the focus shouldn't be on the Catholic Church, but it ought to be on these individuals who are saying these things out in the open, fearlessly, and, uh, and to determine to what extent their words are, in fact, potentially resulting in actions. Thank you for your call, my friend. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Okay. Jeff, Queens, New York, the great WABC. Jeff, how are you, sir? I'm doing real well now that I've finally gotten through to you, sir. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you. I listen to you every night. I'm a 70-year-old, long-in-the-tooth biker, and uh, you know, I just can't <laughs> believe it. this country is becoming. And I just had a suggestion for your perusal. Yes, it's about all these lawyers for Trump's uh, legal representation, and he's been through a number of them over the past few years from what I, I could see. And you are extremely uh, scholarly. You're, uh, you're a constitutional uh, scholar. I believe you are a lawyer. And I was just wondering, you are friends with Donald Trump. What if you would consider representing this man? Well, the problem is I have these contracts, and I can't. But nothing prevents me from passing along my opinions, either publicly or otherwise, you know. I see. And so uh, I do. What you say, I mean, you go right to the, you, 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 you don't pull any punches. You go right no. to the facts. And that's you correct. explain them, and you explain them in a way that the public can understand them. And it's like, well, you know, what's up with his lawyers? How come, you know, they, they see, haven't seemed to reach these conclusions that can help Don well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. We don't know exactly what they're arguing, but they've done a pretty good job. The problem is they're in front of a, uh, a rogue judicial system, a complete Democrat Party control of the law from the charger. That is the prosecutor from the trier of fact. That would be the jury to the referee. That would be the judge. They all come out of the same party. They know who he is. They all got the talking points because Joe Biden is constantly saying that he's a dictator, will lose democracy, Kamala Harris, the whole media. There's no way for him to get a fair trial in that jurisdiction. Everybody knows it. There's no way he's going to get a fair judge in that jurisdiction. And the prosecutor cost is a Soros fraud. So the lawyers, I think, are doing as many things as they can and as much as they can. Um... And if they can't get these appeals and these cases heard outside these uh, these these sort of dark blue Stalinist, I would argue, judicial systems, it's pretty hard to win. And they've got 91 charges against them in four different jurisdictions. You've got multiple different Dem- Democrat prosecutors. You've got Democrat judges who are rushing the cases to get them done before the election. We've never seen anything like this before. And all I can tell you is the, the legal system is dead. It is dead. It is not applied equally. Therefore, it is dead. The Equal Protection Clause, both of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments, but the Fourteenth Amendment after the Civil War, the reason for that is to ensure that people are treated as much as possible the same way. Under the law. It's equal protection under the law. It's due process under the law. And the exact opposite is happening. Joe Biden skates. Joe Biden can violate the Espionage Act repeatedly when he's not president and never be charged. His son is a crook. He will eventually pardon his son if his son is convicted. I can assure you of that. And should he lose, God willing, He will pardon his son anyway, whether there's a trial done or not. Yes, this is corruption. This is tyranny. And it's ugly. But it's hard to go in front of the same judges to make the same arguments 
when the judges are part of the problem, not the solution. And I want to thank you for your call, my friend. A 70-year-old biker guy. I love that. One of the show I love to watch is the American Pickers. I love watching those guys. Go all over the country, meet all kinds of guys. And I love it when they meet the bikers. These older bikers that have collected their motorcycles and so forth. My father's father, my grandfather, Harry, during World War I, he trained our troops on how to use motorcycles. He had an accident once, and he was spitting up blood for many days, and he said to my father, don't allow your kids to ride motorcycles. I know your motorcycle guys don't like to hear that, but we haven't. Okay, so I'll be back next week. I'm going on this mission. Don't get nervous. I know what I'm doing. I will report everything back as soon as I get back. Be safe. God bless you. See you then.